Welcome to Cold Waters with Whiskey Wilson. Cold Waters is a game built by Killer Fish Games that is based on alternative history of a Russia versus United States submarine and naval confrontation taking place around the Norwegian Sea uh, and in the out just north of the North Atlantic. The idea behind it is based on the old Tom Clancy game, um, Red Storm Rising, uh, which Killerfish actually claims a spiritual heritage to that game with Cold Waters. Uh, a game that I'm also familiar with uh, was 688 Attack Sub. Both of these games were built back in the 90s and when this sort of subject was popular. Uh, it was Hunt for Red October had come out recently, if I remember. Um, and there was a general interest in this sort of video game that had come out uh, for PC originally. This is a PC game as well. I'm running version 1.05b and I do have a mod on it and I'll go into detail about what that mod is later. I found out about Cold Waters through watching a couple of videos from the Mighty Jingles. Uh, he's doing currently a Cold Waters series, as well as the live streaming that Jive Turkey does almost daily on YouTube and Twitch. It was a real good chance to get some of the technical ideas of what's actually happening and the underlying technical knowledge that Jive Turkey has as a uh, former Submariner of the United States Navy, as well as just the general feel for the game itself. As I mentioned, I've played the game through the original campaign. It comes with two campaigns in the vanilla loadout, which is one is from 1984 and the other is 1968. And I've played the 1984 through to completion uh, and I really enjoyed it. I played through it on both uh, the medium difficulty level, I forgot what the name of it is, as well as the top difficulty level, which is called Elite. What I really enjoy about the game is the depth of knowledge, but simple interface system that it has. It does lend you to wonder what you might be missing in terms of knowledge as a gamer or a submariner um, with regard to what you could be doing better, but it does actually increase suspense. I also really enjoy the soundtrack that you can hear in the background. Uh, it definitely plays through when you are in the mi major mission map, uh, or I should say the campaign map itself, uh, The and the general sense of suspense that it has. I'm a real big suspense gamer. I won't say I'm a horror gamer, but I do love suspense-based games. Things like Alien Isolation and things like that are at the top of my list. I wanted to start this Let's Play series with trying to answer Jive Turkey's challenge. He has a challenge going on with his patrons uh, to see who can sink the most tonnage inside of a single campaign. Recently it was um, blown out of the water to over a million tons by a um, gentleman that goes by the name of Digital. And so we're trying to sink at least 1100 tons, or pardon me, 1,100,000 tons in order to put our name up on the list. In order to accomplish this task, I've selected a mod that is built and available on subsims.com that uses the a 2004 third option for a campaign, and it allows the use of the Seawolf class uh, attack submarine. Here we are in the main mission screen. As you can see, there are three different campaigns. 1984, which is the first. 1968 is a second option. And the mod that I got from Substance.com allows the use of the 2004 North Atlantic campaign. I tried this mod out a little bit already, so I want to change the save name file just so that we know that it's going to be for the challenge only and start brand new. Um, once again, we're going to say that. Okay, let's click that. Everything set up, let's go. Okay, so what we're going to select is a Seawolf class nuclear attack submarine. Uh, it's definitely the one we want. The model itself is not accurate, but that's a limitation of the game itself over the um, over what the modder can actually create. Um, we do select this ship for two reasons. One, it is super quiet at shallower depths than what the Los Angeles is. And second, and more importantly, it carries more weapon systems. Uh, and that will allow us to sink more tonnage every time we go out on patrol. 
So it looks like from Commander Submarine Forces Atlantic to Commander Whiskey Wilson, effective immediately, you are hereby assigned command of Seawolf Class Submarine USS Seawolf SSN-21, the lead ship in your class. Congratulations and good luck on your command. One thing I do have mixed feelings about with this game, which is very small, is the mixed bag of actual factual history and then completely authored uh, things that help justify the prelude for the 2004 campaign. Um, several things, including this first uh, newsflash, actually happened. Um, a pair of suicide bombers boarded a, a pair of small jetliners uh, coming out of Moscow. Uh, they were armed um, by the Chechen Rebellion that was going on at the time in 2004. This does take place as a precursor to the North Atlantic campaign in terms of date and is pretty accurately depicted. It reads, Terror attacks, Ru terrorists attack Russia. Two airliners destroyed in foreign relations journals. Uh, relations with Russia have soured after 89 passengers died today when two airliners exploded after flying out of Domosedoro. Domosedovo International Airport near Moscow. The explosions were caused by suicide bombers, reportedly female, from the Russian Republic of Chechnya. The Federation has increased tempo of operations against Ukrainian and Chechen separatists, and riot police were called out. Some members of the Russian government have made claims that the terrorists were funded by the United States. The United States denies these allegations, stating that Russia owes its actions in Chechnya are responsible for the act the outbreaks of violence. The one thing I'm not really pleased about is the fact that it mentions Ukraine. The Ukrainian um, pro-Russia thing didn't happen for another 10 years. That happened in 2014, not 2004. Outside of that, it's pretty accurate. The next one, I definitely remember this one definitely happened. Um, as a matter of fact, the little story about it is I was in a National Guard and Reserve unit. And this was published in 2003 in May is when he gave that speech. If I remember correctly, I've got some notes here somewhere. Um, yep, May of 2003. So this actually predates the um, campaign by almost an entire year. Um, it's definitely something that I have a little bit of irony with because when I was a soldier uh, in the uh, in the reserve, I was a reservist. Um, we wound up getting mission orders to go to, to Iraq in deployment of uh, Iraqi freedom um, six months ahead of uh, six months after he after he had given that speech. Um, the next thing that happened was, this is also true, the fourth expansion of NATO, uh, which was mostly the Baltic states, which really really made Russia, the Russia Federation upset. Um, it was basically all of the Balkan states in the, um, in the Baltic Sea that we basically came, that NATO kind of came in and was like, hey, you're not part of the Warsaw Pact anymore. Why don't you come join us? And that's exactly what happened. Um, so Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, um, Slovenia and Slovakia, although I believe Sl Romania and Slovakia might have come at later dates, um, but that also happened in um, 2004, so that's actually a relatively accurate um, piece of information there. And this is where I start getting a little upset. This is um, the screenshots are used in the 1984 campaign, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but this is just completely fake news. Uh, nothing like this happened at all close to when um, it's claimed it happened. Um, a MiG-29 didn't shoot down a 747 and it wasn't Lufthansa or anything like that. This just never actually happened. This next one's sort of a mixed bag because it's talking about the army, the Russian army moving into to Ukraine. 
Um, basically, for me, like, this is sort of like a, yeah, okay, so it's alternate history, and what they've really done is just taken facts and moved them a decade before. Um, the Russian army did move into Ukraine uh, as a part of supporting the pro-Russian separatist movement. Uh, they eventually annexed uh, Crimea, and they've been still, as far as I know of, they're still actively engaged in Ukraine, as well as still Chechnya in their counterinsurgency operations. So this one is true, but not true for the time. Uh, this next one's just completely fake. The picture's taken from a ghost re uh, a not a ghost recon, uh, a, um, Mission Impossible movie, um, so like that one's not true at all. And of course, the last one we don't expect to be true either. Uh, it's the precursor and the last one that happens before you get mission orders to start engaging the Russian Navy. Uh, so yeah, we don't expect the, the Russian invading Poland being like a true thing. Okay, so for, um, from Commander Submarine Forces Atlantic to USS Seawolf, um, we have received orders to find uh, enemy at sea replenishment tankers and tenders um, intending on sailing from Romansk momentarily to rendezvous somewhere in the Barents Sea. We are ordered to find and sink this, sh this ship group. Uh, also, we may get a chance at enemy warships intended to support, but our fa main mission is the um, tankers themselves. So first thing we're going to do is reload. Um, first thing we don't need is to be carrying a lot of Tomahawk land-based missiles. There's only one mission you ever need those for, so uh, and you get a chance to come back and resupply for them anyway, so I don't need them. The other thing is is that I, try, I don't really care for the Harpoon, the UGM-84s. Um, I don't know what the difference between them is, but it seems like the Tomahawk Sea Attack Missile, which is the TASM, is carries more of a warhead for it. I've been able to sink something like larger tankers with a single Tomahawk versus taking, it would take like two Harpoons sometimes. Um, so with that said, we're going to go ahead and head out of Holy Lock, which is where our base is at, and head up into the Norwegian Sea, cross the Spitsbergen, um, or I should say the Svadsbard, um Archipelago if we can. Uh, I sort of expected this. Tomahawks take forever to reload, so um, we missed our first mission window, which is something that we I completely expected, but we'll be getting another mission shortly here soon. You'll see me actually do quite a bit of this um, in order to make sure I'm balancing out tonnage. Um, I, I hate to say that I'm not playing this with the spirit intention, but more the intention of a pirate. Um, and so you'll see me like ignore missions uh, throughout this campaign and engage um, submarine uh, submarine search groups and anti-shipping groups that are loitering about uh, Spitsbergen um, in that um, area as well as the Norwegian Sea. So one thing you get at the end of every mission, whether mission successful or mission failure, is these little windows with a little bit more like of what's going on. Our next mission uh, looks like we have um, a, we have to intercept cruise missile um, submarines in the Norwegian Sea toward, that are heading toward the North Atlantic through the, Nor the Norwegian. Uh, we're supposed to expect a Charlie class or Oscar class. Um, my preference would be an Oscar, they're huge. Um, they do take two. Uh, they do take two Mark 48s, but it's worth every ton. Uh, and they're also really loud. And I've not actually had a problem engaging them. They seem to be very like, oh, it's a submarine. We're going to run away now uh, at eight knots. <laughs> and so I really don't have much of a problem with them. Sometimes their escorts can be kind of problematic though, because they tend to be like Akulas or Alphas very often. So what we're going to do in the meantime, while we're waiting for them to, we're expecting to see them come across the um, littoral waters just north of Norway, past that ASW um, net that you see that that line. And what we're going to do is we're, while we're waiting for them to show up there, we're just going to start clearing house uh, in the Norwegian Sea and taking care of whatever submarine Marines and or surface contacts we can get a hold of. So we have a bearing, we have a contact bearing uh, nine degrees. We're currently heading 277 at 50 feet and five knots. So we're really prepared for a, um, for an attack. Local weather conditions are overcast with a gentle breeze with very weak surface duct and a weak thermal layer at 222 feet. So we're expecting a relatively quiet, um, 
acoustic environment for ourselves to find these submarines, which will be good because often the only subs that are out here on patrol are diesel subs, um, just because the acoustic net is so difficult for the Russians to get by. Um, Russian subs are not known for being quiet. Uh, they do have a really good hull structure. They can dive traditionally deeper than most um, submarines, definitely the Los Angeles class. Um, the Seawolf does keep up with them, I, fa I found out in the long term. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure we close to 15,000 yards uh, and make sure we're loaded out for bear, uh, i.e. like our full torpedo light range. So I immediately hop in game, uh, immediately go to the board and rig for quiet, and we're going to start immediately analyzing what ships these are. Um, the pattern is trying matching up the, bottom, the top lines to the ones on the bottom, if you've not seen... Um, this sort of like a ray setup before and it looks like our first one is going to be a victor 2 um so we actually do have a couple of nuclear uh, nuclear subs going in uh, i do apologize for a couple of things um the first set of videos that i have um with this actually have a pop in the audio and that is was a bad audio setting that I had in the game, so, or not in game, but on my actual computer, and that's really caused the issue. Uh, so I do apologize about that up front. The second part uh, of the issue is that um, the at least this first episode, and I think a couple more, the audio I tried to do in game audio, like record as I'm playing, so you hear what I'm actually thinking firsthand. Um, this particular mission is all going to be after like after action report and sort of like a talk through about how I did what I was doing. Um, so if I get something wrong or I'm not able to read it correctly, I apologize. Oh, and if I misspoke earlier, the, so we do look like we have designated these as Victor II class um, submarines. Um, we are expecting them around 11,000 yards, which is nice. Um, I try if there gets too if they get too close I start worrying about uh, torpedo like how I'm going to engage them on torpedoes. So what we're looking over here on this contact board is whether or not they're listening to us. Um, it, right now we're looking uh, we do have a very quiet acoustic area. It looks like it's 84 decibels. One submarine is in the surface duct with us, and the other one is behind. A, it, the other one is much deeper than that inside of the uh, thermal layer. Um, but we do have good reads on both of them because we're broadside on with our toad array uh, and right now we seem to be in their blind spots uh, just mainly just uh, wherever we're sitting we're getting really negative reads on their um, on our estimates for what their acoustic settings are able to pick us up with the range runs from negative 50 to positive 50 uh, and the higher the number the more guaranteed um, the more confident our sonar team is thinking that they can actually hear and detect us as a submarine so right now we're really happy to just um sort of let time pass and try and get as accurate uh information about where these submarines are located as possible um we haven't because we started off so shallow and so slow it's very difficult for them to hear us um ideally it would be best to be deep um and quiet so not going very fast um but it does seem to be that the, the strategic map has three different speeds you can then go fast and deep which gets you across the mass map fast but when you engage it an enemy target you get you start off at 600 feet or whatever the maximum depth is of the area around you and 20 28 knots i should say uh, the other alternative is 10 knots and 150 feet, and that's if you're just sort of like patrolling a particular area, or if like what we did with here was we stopped and waited for them to come to us. You start at periscope depth in 5 knots. So we had one contact fade on us as we made our um, turn to starboard. We're turning to starboard so we can get our torpedoes on it, but uh, and as a result, our towed array lost contact, and our passive sonar, which which is the forward 90 degree cone basically of the um, of the submarine did not have enough strength to pick it up. The tow array is much better uh, at picking things up when you're going slow, and um, but the downside to it is is that you have to be beam on, like you have to be running almost a perpendicular course to where your target is at. Um, so you basically try and show them the largest um, signature possible if, if they decide to ping you with active sonar. So it's sort of a trade-off that way. 
So what we've done is we've made a turn to starboard so that we can get uh, a shooting solution uh, with, and maintain the wire on CR1. CR1 is getting a little close for comfort for us. Uh, I like to keep our submarine targets um, between six and 9,000 meters. I prefer it on the 9,000 side just because I don't want the torpedo uh, my torpedo acquiring me. I've found that the Mark 48 torpedo is by far the hardest torpedo in the game to uh, outmaneuver and um, basically evade. So uh, I'm I'm guessing that these signatures that we see in CR1 and CR2 in their estimated ranges are far shorter than what they actually are being listed by the sonar guys. Uh, as the solution improves, the number becomes more accurate, but you have this trade-off that it, the longer you wait, the more likely you are to be picked up on theirs and be shot at and be sent into uh, torpedo evasion. So whenever possible, I what I tend to do is actually try and engage them even if my solution is low and then use the, let the torpedo do the, do the calculations as they get close. I kind of use my estimated location in order to get the torpedo on target itself. Um, I'm not certain that that's uh, how it would really work in the real world, but it definitely works for the in-game purposes, so that's what I'm going to let myself get away with doing. Um, what you've seen me do here a little bit is continue the right-hand turn um, so that I can get Victor 2 on the toad array while I'm still pointing my nose toward Victor 1 so that I can get a torpedo off in case he finds me with active sonar and and or he start or and or he gets inside of my like close comfort envelope and I just automatically need to fire off a snapshot just to make sure that he's okay that uh, that he's busy trying to handle my torpedo instead of me being busy trying to handle his so what we're doing right now is we're just going to wait on these range estimates for range and um, solutions to actually improve uh, we're again going to check um, the environment I think here in a second and just make sure that we let time sort of lapse part of the part of the wonderful thing about this um, game is that you develop so much tension by um, just sitting still. It can be a little tedious, but you do have the ability to time compress, uh, and you'll see me use some of that uh, sooner or later at some point. So what I want to do here is I am right now setting up the torpedoes to engage where I believe that they should. So we have one that's at that's at shallow depth and one that's at deep depth. So you see me changing the respective torpedoes. Uh, the right hand bank fires out of the right hand side of the submarine. So that means that uh, they are easier to keep the wire than the ones that are firing out of the left hand side if your target's on the right uh, and vice versa. Um, the torpedo numberings, uh, according to Jive Turkey, are not, his, are not accurate to reality. Um, it goes even number is on the starboard side and odd numbers are on the um, port side. So it would be one, go across to two, go down to the left to get three, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in game, it goes one, two, three, four down the left hand bank and then five, six, seven, eight down the right hand bank. Um, one of the disadvantages in 1.05B is that Torpedo tube 7 and 8 seem to have a glitch where it's difficult to get them to accurately pick up what's um, actually loaded visually, and sometimes they don't load correctly when you're in the other menu screens like the other six do. So you'll see me avoid using those if at all possible. So what we've done is, um, as we as we imagined, um, the submarine was a, quite a bit closer than what we thought. Uh, we had an original estimated range of about a 11,000 yards, it turns out they're much closer to currently being estimated at about seven. Um, so that's inside of our comfort uh, inside of our comfort zone. So what we want to do is spook them and put them on the defensive. So what we're going to do is engage with two tor we engaged with two um, Mark 48 torpedoes, one sent to each submarine. Uh, the last thing we want to do is have one submarine counterfire us while we have the first submarine uh, engaged defensive. So that's the reason why you see me shooting off two, even though I really didn't have a clue where the um, second where Sierra two where this target Sierra two was at. Um, so that was the first Sierra who had um, 
tried to ground himself into the ground and you see me make some manual adjustments uh, since I still retain the wire. Beaching yourself into the seafloor was actually a valid Russian tactic using the, because their hulls were so strong. And I will say the Mark 48 torpedo has trouble engaging a target that it that if you don't have a full shooting solution on, it is very it has a very hard time picking out where on the seafloor the enemy submarine is. Often um, the noisemakers just create such havoc on the Mark 48s that they just never find it. So right now we're just going to watch the torpedoes as they travel to their targets. Um, unfortunately, early in, I did not realize that you could turn on the ability to see targets that you don't have a full shooting solution on. Normally, uh, in the vanilla game, it's set up so that unless you have a greater than 85% shooting solution, you don't see the target at all. So um, it, one thing that I want to be changing for future episodes um, is the ability to see it regardless. Unfortunately, it's something I only picked up. What's happening here is that um, that the second Victor sub drops a noisemaker and makes a hard turn to starboard in order to try and get out of the acquisition cone of the Mark 48, but the Mark 48 went into noisemaker uh, avoidance homing uh, in order to get a new bearing on where the target was. He fired it and found it. So that was a really easy um, set up for us it was a quick ambush and a really good introduction to the uh, to the game we're still at 100 percent i just want to always i usually like to try and go in and make sure i'm not damaged at all um i tend to do crazy things we have our four green lights no vessels no weapons no aircraft no flooding so that's good leave combat we take out two victors so congratulations to us we actually identified them correctly yep of course it's not our mission but every ton counts for us in our challenge and so that should be what we're going to do is we're going to park over here, review our orders, make sure we're going to be where we think we're going to be. Yeah, okay, that seems about right. So um, so this seems like as good a time as any to stop for the day. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been Cold Waters with Whiskey Wilson, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one.